bunch of introductions and thank yous. I won't be too long. Um, but I'll ask you to hold your applause until we are done with uh, everything. I want to say just uh, one or two things. I had thought about what I would say for a couple of days, and I came upon this a great idea that I would summon the spirit of Frederick Douglass to this room with the RT campus, and then uh, Olivia Kin, the great sculptor who has produced these Frederick Douglass monuments, emailed me this morning and said, I'm driving around with the extra Frederick Douglass statue in my van. Do you think we could bring him into it in South Carolina? And I said, that would be great. But now, my introduction is shot, because literally, Frederick Douglass is with us and standing over there. And this picks up the theme from last night, where Frederick Douglass was on the stage in a very imposing uh, manner. But we are delighted that he is with us today uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, RIT is an institute of higher learning, but it's a place that's dedicated to what I would say is 21st century learning, computing technology, social media, all of the things that make our students go. I think Frederick Douglass would be very comfortable with all of these things. He loved books, he loved arts, but he also loved technology. I don't think we talk about that enough. Uh, he was an information technologist through his printing press. He wrote passionately and searchingly on photography as a truth-telling medium that would help the black struggle for justice. Uh, he thought a lot about engineering uh, because of the Erie Canal, because of railroads, because of the transportation networks that were occurring uh, across the American landscape. Um, he was a startup artist. The North Star is nothing but a startup company. And I think for the people who study entrepreneurship and launching businesses here, you could have a lot to say about going off with a big idea and then having to work on your business plan after you start things up. And David Blight covers these things magnificently in his book. But Douglas uh, would be a very interesting person to talk to our students about going out in the world with all of your thoughts and hopes and dreams and watching the world say, okay, we have uh, a few things we want to tell you. I think it would be a really interesting conversation. But there's another reason that RIT is connected to Frederick Douglass. And again, I think this is something we don't talk about too much. In 1829, one of Rochester's precursor institutions, the Athenaeum, the Rochester Athenaeum was created here in Rochester. Its namesake was Nathaniel Rochester, a slaveholder from the Chesapeake region, a slave trader who came up to New York, eventually, so one story goes, emancipated enslaved people, but uh, we're doing a lot of uh, reworking of that story. The Athenaeum was dedicated to uplift, especially for a new city like Rochester, this was very important. Um, and so it sponsored lectures and talks and did things that a lot of uh, arts and idea-minded people uh, would want in the 1820s, 30s, 40s. Think about this, Frederick Douglass was about 11 years old when the Athenaeum was created. And he too was sharing that spirit of uplift and improvement. He was trying to steal literacy in any way he could. He eventually got a copy of the plumbing order. So hundreds of miles apart, uh, two people associated with Chesapeake bondage were involved in American arts, letters, and uplift. So the Athenaeum prospers. Eventually, <clears throat> later on, it merges with another institution, and then that leads to RIT. But in the 1850s, the Athenaeum is associated with Corinthian Hall which is the grandest lecture hall in Rochester. All the great speakers, Emerson, uh, speak there. All the great entertainers who come to Rochester speak there. It's one of the great venues in central and western New York. Nobody owns that venue more than Frederick Douglass, who gives several speeches there. And his most important and impressive and world-shaking speech, What to the Slave, is the 4th of July, is given there on July 5th in 18. 52. David Blight calls this the rhetorical masterpiece of abolitionism and his greatest speech, I won't say by far, but I do think it is his greatest speech by far. Students study this speech in Rochester, across the nation, around the world. He gives it in Corinthian Hall, which is associated, of course, with the Athenaeum. In doing that, I think he blows apart Nathaniel Rochester's claim on the Athenaeum. In other words, he blows apart a slaveholder's claim in American uplifting ideas. He puts his stamp on the Athenaeum, on Corinthian Hall, on Rochester. Think about it this way. Who today, outside of Rochester, thinks about Nathaniel Rochester? Very few people. Who 
today doesn't think about Frederick Douglass outside of Rochester. Not too many. You have to get right with Frederick Douglass if you're an American, if you're interested in civil rights. Frederick Douglass is Rochester, the most important person who lived in Rochester in the 19th century, an abolitionist, a former slave, who gave his greatest speech in a hall built in many ways by a slave woman. I think Frederick Douglass would be smiling, a big smile. Um, closest to me is Dr. Carvin Eisen, who is uh, a force to be reckoned with in Rochester. He's the project director of this year-long initiative, Re-Energizing the Legacy of Frederick Douglass, which filled a void. There was really nothing going on uh, relating to the bicentennial, even if people were thinking about it in Rochester. If you can imagine that. Frederick Douglass is Rochester, and he got together with Blue Seas, and Chris Christopher, and bunch of other people, and they created a whole roster of events that were uh, magnificent. He's an associate professor of communication at the College of Brockport and the director of a stunning documentary, July 64, about urban unrest and civil rights in Rochester in the early 1960s. Uh, next to Dr. Eisen is Olivia Kim, who is an adjunct professor here in RIT School of Art and Design, and uh, a sculptor of <coughs> Uh, renown. Um, she's a rock star. If any of you hung around last night at Hochstein Performance Hall, you know that there were two hot spots. One was the book signing associated with Ken Morris and David Blight. The other was on stage where Olivia Kim was holding court with Frederick Douglass and a wide group of people. Um, I don't mean this in the way it's going to sound. We had to literally kick them off stage and get them out of the venue because <laughs> it was 10.30 and the time was growing short and there was uh, the prospect that we could get charged for uh, all these other hours, and I don't want to go back to... Uh, I, I, I've run out of patience with the, the Dean and the Provost, so President Munson, I was going to come to you directly uh, if, if we got charged extra. Um, so Olivia Kim is the uh, sculptor who produced these magnificent uh, replica statues of Frederick Douglass that appear around town. Uh, we visited about six of them yesterday, David Blight and I, uh, and they are just... Um, a beautiful addition to the Rochester commemorative landscape. Next to Olivia Kim is Robert Benz, who is the co-founder and executive vice president of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, which is an advocacy and educational organization. It's dedicated to a whole series of things, including conversation about activism today. Activists who imbibe the legacy of Frederick Douglass, one of the things that they've done and we'll talk about here today is co-sponsor this initiative, the FD200 which every couple of weeks during the bicentennial year rolled out a new selection of activists around the country and across the world who um, kind of represented Frederick Douglass's activist spirit in the 21st century. So can we give a big round of applause to our panel? And I want to ask you real briefly to just talk about uh, what you learned this year in this uh, bicentennial celebration of Frederick Douglass, but uh, beyond that, I want you to talk about where you want to go. What your hope is for the next step uh, once the bicentennial year ends, um, particularly in terms of commemoration, monuments. We have a lot of conversations, you and I, about how Rochester reaches out to the world in a conversation about our troubling moment. Frederick Douglass' ability to navigate us out Well, first of all, Rich, thank you very much for such a wonderful introduction. And also, thank you to RIT and the University of Rochester for putting on this extraordinarily important conference and to address the issues that we are facing now. I couldn't be uh, more delighted to participate and um, uh, the fact that uh, Frederick Douglass lived on this earth, uh, spent time, significant time in Rochester, and 120 something years after his life, he is still able to fill a room. That says something powerful about this man and the legacy that follows him. And I think that, like that song in The Lion King, he lives in you, he lives in us now. And I'm just delighted to be part of that. In many ways, the Monuments Project 
Um, I approach like that. I, I approached uh, many other projects. I foolishly think that I'm just going to go and put 200 monuments on the streets of Rochester, New York. And that is exactly what I thought. Uh, why not, right? But um, I quickly found out that the attempt to distribute and place monuments on the street of an American city about a black man, a monument about that represents the visage of a black man, is even if that black man is Frederick Douglass, is still a powerfully political act and there will be resistance to that, and there was resistance to that. But obviously we overcame. Uh, what we wanted to do was borrow the majesty and the legacy of Frederick Douglass that stands on that pedestal in Highland Park in Rochester, New York, and bring it down to the streets of Rochester. So people uh, today uh, could see an image of Frederick Douglass and maybe question, why is this monument in this place? What is this doing? Because they just popped up, right? For, for most people, all of a sudden it's not there, and then one day it's there. So uh, we put them there. And the other thing about them that, the, apart from the monument itself, which I think that this uh, young lady did an extraordinary job, and I just want to take this time to applaud her right now. Every time I think about it, what I think where we were almost a year ago, there were no monuments, and today there are, in fact, a year ago there were no monuments, and today there are 13 monuments. Uh, we're just really pleased, and it took a lot of work on her part, which I'm sure she'll talk about. But we wanted to uh, engage the community, and one aspect of this monument that I am just overwhelmed with is the a QR code that's at the base of it, and I'm sure if you can if you can see it, you can see there's a little QR code. This is often technology will fail you, right? It has happened to all of us. But if you take your cell phone and you go up to that QR code and you have a QR code reader, it will take you right to a website that will give you verse and chapter of why that monument is there. You can read it or you can listen to it, and it will help you to understand why Frederick Douglass is in that space. So that's what we wanted to try to do. Uh, I think no fitting, there's no more fitting a legacy uh, than to engage people where they are. Uh, we often ask the question, what would Frederick Douglass say about the fact that there is a black female mayor in Rochester? What would Frederick Douglass say about the fact that there is uh, three hundred percent infant mortality in black women compared to white women in Monroe County. What would Frederick Douglass say about the school district in Rochester, New York, that out of 429 school districts, it's the number 429th uh, when, uh, when compared to the number one school district in Rochester in, in uh, our region, which is a 10-mile drive away. So we just wanted to pose those questions and talk about those issues. As a journalist, what would Frederick Douglass say about this concept, this totally stupid concept of alternate truth, right? A different truth. What would Frederick Douglass say about that? When we know that journalism and a society is based on empirical data that is verifiable. So what would Frederick Douglass, well, how would he contribute uh, to this conversation. And so that's what we wanted to do. And we're just really excited about it and thrilled about it and the fact that it has brought our community together. And this is, and, and, and I'll stop with this. I, I, I try to say this every time I get a chance to talk. Rochester, New York holds no second status to any city in the country when it comes to social justice issues, social justice understanding social justice uh, commitment, and we have to get back to that now, and I wanted to be part of that, because there are people, and rightfully so, who believe that what is erected in the public space is a representation of the deepest thoughts and beliefs that they have, and so uh, at a point in our, our history, these monuments were erected for a reason. They're not just erected for fun and games, they are erected to assert domination in terms of culture, they're, they're, uh, 
they're placed in, in locations uh, with codicils that say that no, in the, in the case of um, a monument in Alexandria, Virginia, this, I looked into this monument, Civil War monument of a soldier. The, it, looking further into it, it says that no city council now or at any time in the future can remove this monument from this public space. So even if the community changes and starts to question the, the positioning of this particular uh, piece of work, it can't be removed. So, so there's a lot of discussion that has to happen, and we think that while monuments in certain uh, uh, municipalities across the country serve to polarize and isolate uh, individuals within the community, it is clear that our monument of Frederick Douglass has served to centralize and bring our community together. So I'm not saying, well, I could say, that we should replace all other Civil War monuments with the monument of Frederick Douglass, but that would be too simplistic. We can't say it that way. But what we can do is use this monument and what this man stood for to examine the placement of these monuments and why they, why, why they are there and what, they, what the implications of them are being in those spaces. And that would create dialogue. Right? And that would create, hopefully, understanding. We're not all going to come to the same understanding, but to have dialogue about it in, thi in this time that we live in now, I think is one of the reasons that we wanted to do that. The thing that's really striking, Olivia, is not just the way that people have connected to the idea of these Douglas replica statues, which is powerful enough, but the way that they connect to the parts of the body eyes, the hands. We saw that last night. People were moved to stand next to the statue, to take a picture with the statue, to look into his eyes. I think David Blight might have mentioned that. Ken Morris, you mentioned those are your hands, but looking at them up there, you know, the idea of shaking your hands was, was really uh, powerful. I really appreciate that you noted this um, uh, very important feature of the sculpture, which is that it's very much a multifaceted project. Uh, I began uh, by researching at the U of R archives. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Oh my gosh, got your name, but you're right there. <laughs> um, excuse me, Alex. Travis. Travis, your goodness. Sorry. R I T. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I went to the archives. Um, actually, a good friend of mine, Miranda Mims. Uh, we went to school of the arts together. Uh, started working there. And so I went to the archives and she, she took me around to see the various photographs of Douglas. Um, so unless, unless if you're familiar with my work, I, I will just introduce my work a little bit. I do uh, specialize in body movement um, in a very insanely profound way, I would say. Uh, normally when we look at the way people move, uh, we're not really paying attention. Well, I am. <laughs> um, I have uh, delved deeply into uh, the biomechanics, uh, the kinetic uh, quality of movement, and have even done several different types of physical training in order to be able to create a kind of bridge between the conscious mind and the instinctive body. So there's a very profound language um, that I'm perceiving in body movement. Uh, you can essentially ascertain a person's psychological um, emotional and um, physical makeup just through a simple gesture. It's phenomenal. So um, through this study that I've gone, uh, have been um, going through for over a decade, um, I wanted to apply this to this project. Um, what is deepest in my heart is to find a way to connect all peoples of all different cultures um, you know, you can, should I list it? Race, age, <laughs> denomination. Yeah. The point is, what is, universal, what is universal about being a human being? And I would have to say the very simplest thing is, um, it's our bodies. How do we live in our body? And I think that uh, Frederick Douglass is an incredible example because essentially what it is, he had to go through the voyage of having experienced a type of physical 
uh, bondage or let's say coercion, okay? Um, he witnessed physical brutality, the, the feelings and the emotions that come out of people when they're mistreated, right? When they're not respected for their humanity. So uh, what I really wanted to do with this project was to research the images of Douglas and observe how he changed. Now, obviously, photography at that time was very static. A person had to stay still for I don't know how long. Someone here knows how long, but it was a long time. And we all know what the resting face is. It's like this. <laughs> okay? Um, but I did notice something that at the, towards the end of his life, now it could, it could also be involved with the changing technology, right? That you can capture <coughs> briefer moments in time. But you do get to see him smiling. And there's a restfulness in him, um, especially in his later years. And what I really thought was important for our day today is um, because this sculpture, like Carbon is saying, is helping to equalize and better represent our culture today in America, I, I very much wanted to show how uh, within his own lifetime, he was able to at least get through this hurdle of emancipation, okay? Um, it was, you can see the enormous amount of struggle in his face, the tension in his body. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in those photos. And because the image is so powerful and it impresses itself so deeply in our subconscious minds, I think that this is how, how he was able to create change. So what, going back to the sculptures, um, because of this profound effect that an image or a sculpture that stays has on the subconscious mind. I knew it was very important to make sure that the body language has to really be well thought out and very well considered. And so today's message I would have to say is, what do people need to see? Because as Ken and I spoke about last night, to dwell on the negative actually has a tendency to recreate the negative. Okay? Think about it, folks. <laughs> Um, so there's a delicate balance between acknowledging what is and understanding what it is that you want to change, right? Then there's the other difference of negative, 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 right? Now we get a lot of that in the media. So this sculpture in particular, I wanted to um, have a very positive message to express his deep humanity and his compassion because I think that is really what we're looking for today. We're looking for a kind of compassion that um, is very much based inside of ourselves. So I actually shifted the posture of this sculpture ever so slightly. You almost can't see it, but if you look, you'll see it. Um, the original bronze monument that was made in 1899 actually has more of a kind of like the stately presence of a person who is speaking out into the public because that is obviously who Douglas was. But here, I actually did a little bit of a shift, and it's so subtle, it's insane. I'll show you the profile, okay? So if you're, if you're standing like this, right? Here, let's go 3D. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. So if, if I'm standing like this, right? right? And then you shift like this. It is so subtle. Do it another time. <laughs> okay. So three more, three more times. <laughs> okay. So um, right. Okay. So it's a very slight shift. Now, someone who probably does dancing would be able to see that. I'll do it one more time. So like this. And then. Right? So subtle. Now, these are the kinds of expressions that we're looking at every day. And um, because I saw, I've been seeing since I've been a young girl, that images of women and men and magazines and, and media and such have such a profound effect on children and children who grow up to be adults. I knew that this man had to have a kind of internal knowing of himself. Okay, because that is what the whole struggle was about. If you guys agree with me, this is the way I saw it. What is it to 
be born into slavery, to know that you are free inside, and to realize that physically outside of yourself, right? And to find that for everybody else around you. Okay, so that was Douglas's, um, I would say, prime directive. Free himself inside, mentally, emotionally, physically, and then spread it out to everybody else. Uh, so I believe that this, this was the physical message that I wanted to convey with this sculpture. And not to mention the fact that it does have elements of Ken Morse's face and hands. Um, this is also part of an evolving kind of series of sculptures which are always kind of drawing on the uh, descendants of the Douglas family to show the public how the Douglas family is continuing on with its message to um, complete, complete, we're looking for completion, right? For human rights. How many black men are presented in monument in American history, in American culture today? Tell me one. Magic Silence Johnson across the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Leading right. the break. Magic Johnson, of course, but the metaphor is that if you are an athlete, yeah. right, and you achieve a certain stra status of, of accomplishment, of course you'll be venerated because you made a lot of money for that institution, right? Frederick Douglass didn't make a lot of money for any institution. So the, the metaphor, to complete the metaphor, the idea is that it is difficult, and I'm telling you, it's a political act to place a monument of a black man on the streets of an American city. I faced it in doing this project. There was fierce <coughs> resistance to doing this. Right? I went to people who said, who I know know how to do this, because you guys know that we had 200 horses and 500 benches, and 25 golf balls, and all of those things. So people know how to do that kind of work. So I said, hey, let's go and put a monument of our, uh, what, what the uh, mayor of Rochester at the time called Rochester's most venerated citizen. Let's do that. Absolute silence fell across the landscape, right? We're not doing that. But, you know, uh, it has been my privilege to do things that people don't want to get done. Douglas is hot. <laughs> and we heard it earlier from Olivia. He's Freddie. He's Freddie D. <laughs> and, um, you know, when Robert was talking about our work in the first panel, and it's with um, students, uh, mostly K through 12 students. And we kicked off the bicentennial celebrations uh, February of 2017 at the Library of Congress when we launched our One Million Abolitionist Project, which is our book project. And you've heard that we have published a special bicentennial edition of Frederick Douglass's narrative, his first autobiography, which was first published in 1845. And it has been, first of all, humbling to have his blood flowing through my veins and to have an opportunity to see how 200 years after his birth, people are celebrating and commemorating him. We are introducing his life and legacy to a younger generation that most don't know about him. Um, some of them know about him because, believe it or not, when we sent our manuscript to the printer on January 31st, was that 2017? The next, and, and Robert and I were talking about how are we going to get publicity for this, this project? And living in California, my phone the next morning was blowing up because the person that sits in the Oval Office woke up and on February 1st said, Frederick Douglass has done the amazing job. I'm hearing more and more. And, we received lots and lots of requests for media, so that problem of trying to uh, figure out how we were going to publicize what we were doing was gone, and that actually is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, we still hear about that everywhere we go, but what it did, though, it, it, it kind of awakened the consciousness of 
um, children and students because they were hearing this name Frederick Douglass that they might not necessarily knew much about. And so to get back to your question, Rich, um, it has been amazing to see how excited people are everywhere to learn about Frederick Douglass. And, and the, those that know about him or know his story, uh, we've been able to have conversations that dive deeper into who he was and what he was about. And um, also talk a lot about, which I know David addressed last night during his uh, lecture, and I'm sure we'll talk about today, just his love of words and how good he was with words. And, and so we spent a lot of time in, in classrooms and literature classes and English uh, classes and just talking about language. But humbled is the word that I really um, think that it is just, um, it, it's, it's hard to put into words how um, it's been to see, see this. David Blight is the class of 54 professor of history at Yale University. He's the author of many really important books, American Oracle on writers in the Civil War, Race and Reunion, on the legacy of the Civil War and the attempt to find the nation's wounds by ignoring some of the legacies of emancipation and race. And of course he's with us uh, in Rochester to talk about his brand new biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. And we're talking about what we have learned during this bicentennial year. David, Douglas is hot. You've given 32 speeches since your book came out in October. I get the sense you're like a rock star now. You wake up and you don't know what city you're in. Um, but no, you're, I'm in Rochester. You're in Rochester. <laughs> you um, first of all, Rich, you're really good at this moderating thing. Can you come to Yale and fill in for me in the next couple of months? <laughs> Anyway, um, well, a couple of things in particular. Hot is the operative word right now. I, I get that. But what has struck me out on this circuit uh, is how much people want Douglas to have something to say in the present. Constant. And, you know, we all know why. Uh, there, there's a political culture right now that has us begging for meaning, begging for voices that... that help us place our feet to voices that help us get back to creeds, values, great ideas, facts, truth, the Constitution. Uh, and Douglas has something to say about all these things. Uh, lots of people have, but he has had something to say about all these things. There's a deep hunger to connect past and present and find the voices of the past that can help us constantly, uh, press requests, and this goes back to actually, in recent times it goes back to first the massacre in Charleston, which, you know, suddenly exploded the whole Confederate flag and monument question like never before, and suddenly every, everyone in the world, they were calling American, whoever they could get on the phone, especially uh, historians suddenly were we're cool to these people, which is pretty weird for us. <laughs> Asking us, so this Confederate calls from New Zealand, and calls from Pakistan, and the reporters ask me, this Confederacy thing, uh, uh, what is it? And why do you Americans have a problem with it? You know, God, you ask, how many hours do you have? But I remember myself falling back on Douglas even during that, uh, because, oh, God, did he have a lot to say about the Confederacy. He has some great definitions for the Confederacy. Um, but it's that connection past and present. The other thing that I've been struck by again and again and again, and I kind of knew this before, but not as much as in, in these past months, is just how much Douglas is now taught um, all over the world. And um, almost entirely for the good, I think. Just a week ago, I I think a week ago yesterday at the New York Historical Society, I did a about a four-hour seminar with a group of 20 New York City area teachers, middle school and high school teachers. I've done lots and lots of summer institutes with teachers for 20-some years. This one was put on by an organization called the um, New York Academy for Teachers. Uh, at any rate, they, almost all from public schools, some from private schools. They all teach Douglas. 
even the eighth grade, the eighth grade teachers. They all teach either the narrative or speeches or combinations of both. They all have projects going. They all have their own thoughts and designs of how to teach the Fourth of July speech. It's amazing. I mean, I'm learning from them. I, I was just in Vermont, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. Ran into a, a teacher came to the event in Burlington. Who, actually, two or three came who had been in my summer institute on the life and writings of Frederick Douglass about three years ago. And he brought me this huge a, a copy of this project his class had created about Douglass. Kids performing speeches, kids rewriting a slave narrative as they might imagine it in their own times about modern slaves. And just amazing stuff that's being done with Douglass. And I'm old enough to know that it's not very long ago this was not the case. It just was not the case. Frederick Douglass's narrative was out of print for nearly a century. It was brought back into print in 1960 by Benjamin Quarles, the great African-American historian of Morgan State. Then there were some other, a couple other editions in the 60s and the 70s, a couple more editions. But Douglass wasn't taught anywhere except in some black schools and colleges for almost a century. Now we have this this new situation to reap, which which you all were talking about in the first panel, um, and I could I couldn't help thinking during the I loved that first panel by the way I got all kinds of thoughts, uh, Olivia, on your use of the term universal and all the other kinds of artistic renderings that are going on with Douglas right now. And I'd love to talk about that. But I can't help thinking I had 50 years. I won't be here. Not many of us. Students will, but or a hundred years, and they'll look back at this moment and they'll say, "My God, what the, the kind of memorial stuff that was going on there in the early 21st century? Man, that that country was screwed up, or that country was messed up, or that country was becoming something wholly new. It was having all these identity crises and all these debates over identity. But my God, they were replacing their memorial landscape." They were renovating, is your word, their memorial landscape. And they were finding ways to augment, replace, or however you want to think about it, that deep impact that the Confederacy and the Civil War memorialization had on us and on our country. And how will this be judged? You know, what, what you're doing, what we're doing, how will this be judged? Uh, will we overdo it? Will we underdo it? Uh, you know, will we be criticized as uh, all artistic renderings are by the next generations and the next generations? And the answer is, of course we will. We absolutely will. But that's what makes the responsibility for all of us, from, from teaching, to being artists, to being filmmakers, to running an organization that reaches out to as many millions of people as, as you can with the best possible history. I mean, there's a, there's a huge responsibility in this. But I really loved your use of the word universal because hardly anybody wants to use that word anymore. Uh, it's an old-fashioned word. But one of the reasons Douglas is taught all over the world, I'm totally convinced of this, is that in the narrative, just take the narrative alone, which is the thing most of us is that it is such a universal story. It's a coming of age story. It's a child coming into adulthood story. But it's a coming of age story out of the most American of problems.